year, YSCMR is held as an international conference attracting more than 170 abstracts from postgraduates and early career researchers under the themes of biological sciences, chemical sciences, physical sciences, and social sciences. The inaugural session of this event is held as an hybrid event. So I kindly request all of you to mute your mics and switch off your video cameras. Let us now commence today's program by singing the national anthem. Please rise up for the national anthem. be seated. So first of all, let me invite the co-chair of the conference, Mr. Umay Khaliullah, to deliver the welcome speech. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Young Scientist Conference on Multidisciplinary Research by SCMR 2021 virtual international conference organized by the Young, Young Scientists Association of the National Institute of Fundamental Studies. I would like to sincerely welcome Professor Panduka Karnanayaka, keynote speaker, and Professor Tom Welton, guest speaker of the conference. I would like to welcome the chairman of NIFS, Professor Atula Sumatipala, the acting director of NIFS, Professor Ranjit Premalaldi Silva, distinguished guests, all our scientists, and all of you who are joining us online and those within the Institute. 
NIFS is a national international national conference. NIFS is a national institute which conducts scientific research on fundamental studies and advanced studies with emphasis for advancement of science. This year, NIFS is celebrating its 40th anniversary and YSCMR is organized as a part of the celebration. The Young Scientists Association of NIFS, YSA was established in 2018 to create a, an environment to promote research culture and dynamic working and learning environment among the scientific community, including research assistants, undergraduates and volunteers who engage with research at NIFS. YSCMR 2021 is the, is the third consecutive research at conference organized by the YSA. And this year we have taken a step ahead in organizing an international level conference. With the current pandemic situation, we have taken up the challenge in, organ in organizing this event, virtually with the help of the chairman, the acting director, all our scientists and the staff of National Institute of Fundamental Studies for more than 140 part presenters with the theme of multidisciplinary research for tomorrow's challenges. The conference is organized under four themes, biological sciences, chemical sciences, physical sciences, and social sciences, for which we receive abstract from both Sri Lankan and foreign institutes. While taking, thanking all the members of organizing committee, I congrat congratulate all which, all which and I congratulate and wish good luck to all the presenters who will be presenting today. We hope you will have a productive and enjoyable day at YSCMR 2021. Thank you, welcome all. Thank you. This conference, YSCMR 2021, is held as one of the key events of, these, of the series of celebrations organized by the NIFS to commemorate the 40th anniversary of this premium research institute. Therefore, I would like to now invite Professor Deepa Subhasinghe, the chairman of the 40th anniversary celebrations organizing committee to address the gathering. Thank you, Dr. Shalini. Good morning, everyone. Yes, this year is a very special year to the National Institute of Fundamental Studies as we are completing 40 years since the establishment of the Institute. Being a person who has seen the Institute since its early days, I consider it's an honor and privilege for me to write, uh, for me to deliver this message as the co-chair of the 40th anniversary commemoration committee. Basic and fundamental research are essential for country to stay ahead in knowledge. A country that relies on the knowledge generated by other countries will always stay behind. Further, unique and local issues need to be addressed in local country. Realizing this fact, the then Institute of Fundamental Studies, or IFS as he called it, was established by an act of parliament in 1981. So this is the 40th year. The founding director was Professor Chandra Vikramasinghe. Then in 1985, late Professor Thiril Pornam Peruma, the second director, brought the institute to Kandy, and he developed it to a modern, fully-fledged research institute, as you can see now. Uh, during the last four decades, the institute has gone through different phases, developments, and produced a number of excellent scientists, inventors, and academics, and also uh, contributed immensely to the scientific knowledge and to the national development. As the only institute in Sri Lanka mandated to conduct basic and fundamental research, the NIFS plays a unique role both in knowledge generation and dissemination. Conferences, workshops, colloquia are essential parts of the dissemination of science. 
Uh, this year's Young Scientist Conference on Multidisciplinary Research is held as a part of the 40th anniversary commemoration events. The Young Scientist at the NIUF has continued with this conference uh, despite uh, many different additional challenges this year because of the pandemic. Actually, when I look back uh, in my life, I feel that the time I spent here at the IFS as a research assistant is the best time of my life, although I did not realize it at that time. Uh, not only I got my MPhil degree and paved the way to my PhD, I also acquired a lot of skills and also a lot of memory. Uh, many of the presentation skills, I mean, mainly we got a lot of presentation skills, writing skills, and organizing skills, and many lot of other experiences, and learned a lot. And we uh, organize workshops like these as all. Well. Also, we help to organize large international workshops with a large number of prominent international scientists. Those days, they used to come here. And sometimes we had to go and collect them from the airport. And on the way back, we had a lot of time, sometimes three, four hours, to talk with them. It was a very exciting and excellent uh, experience. Now I see that our young generation is doing the same. This conference is solely organized by our young budding scientists. But during the last few months, they put a lot of efforts into that. And I can see that uh, there are many distinguished scientists agreed to deliver keynote speeches and public webinars. And there's a, uh, now I heard that more than 170 abstracts were submitted to the uh, conference. And it is evidence of the level of interest, especially among the young generation of scientists. I wish to thank all of those who worked hard and contributed to the 40th anniversary events, including the chairman, director, organizing committee, reviewers, authors, sponsors, as well as the academic and non-academic staff of the INF AF. I wish the conference a success. And uh, at this moment, I like to take this opportunity to remind you of the other events we have organized as a part of the 40th anniversary. On the on 27th of this month, we have a very interesting lecture by Professor Kirti Tenokong, one of our former directors. And I'm sure it will be a very interesting, uh, very uh, useful and enjoyable lecture. So I kindly request you to remember the date and participate. And next month, on November 17th, we have another very interesting and very uh, exciting lecture by our founding director, Professor Chandra Vittavajin. So please uh, note down them in your diary and try to attend those lectures. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I take the honor of inviting the acting director of the NIFS, Senior Professor Ranjit Premila de Silva, to address the gathering. Very good morning to all of you. I'm very happy to join this event together with young scientists of the country to mark the 40th anniversary of the NIFS and also this is a series of one of the series of events that we have planned to celebrate the existence of NIFS over a period of four decades. NIFS being the premier fundamental research institution of the country. During this journey of 40 years, 
has contributed immensely for the furtherance of research, especially fundamental research, and also in training young scientists, young budding scientists to deliver what is expected from them as a group of scientists in the country. We have made number of publications over this 40 year period. We have introduced number of new findings to the nation as an institution. And also one of our great achievement is that we have also managed to develop the capabilities and skills of young scientists who can take over the research agenda of this country tomorrow. That is one of our great, great achievement. Well, uh, scientists can do research, spend all the time in the laboratory or in the field, conducting the experiments, trials. But at the end of the day, the output of the research, output of the findings should be communicated to the public or for the benefit of public. If that link is missing, what we produce will not be used for the benefit of the society. Our outputs will not be utilized for the betterment of the society. Then there's a serious issue. Over the years, with my experience in organizing number of conferences, symposia, workshops, what I found was we need to develop the skills of the young scientists towards proper scientific communication. That's a very important thing. We need to learn the science and art of communicating scientifically with the fellow scientists. The Young Scientist Conference is a forum where you can develop your skills towards le learning or acquiring your skills for proper scientific communication. It is important that we publish our research findings. It says, as scientists, either you should publish or perish. So it is important that you come and present your scientific work and share your experience, share the solutions that you have found your problems in the research journey and share how you face the challenges in your research work with the peers or other fellow young scientists. So this is an opportunity and a forum for you to come forward, share your experiences with others. So that helps you to communicate properly because we all as scientists, we all speak one language. It's scientific language. We should know how to communicate, how to present, how to organize, and how to deliver scientific findings. It's not a normal communication. Scientific communication is different. What we highlight, what we emphasize, what we prioritize is different to normal communication. So to learn that art of scientifically communicating with the others, especially with other scientists, it is important that you have this kind of event. So Young Scientist Conference organized by the NIFS as a activity of 40th year celebration, 40th anniversary celebration of NIFS is helping you to develop your skills 
in communication. Not only the writing skills, but also the skills that you have for presenting and also discussing issues which are of high scientific value. So I congratulate all of you, those who have joined here today, to share this experience through the Young Scientists Conference. And I'm sure this would pave the way for you to be in the highest level of research individuals in the country, research scientists in the country. So with that, I thank the organizers for inviting me to deliver a short address at the commencement of this very important national event on the theme multidisciplinary research for tomorrow's challenges. We need to cross the boundaries of our own disciplines because the solutions that we need to find are not within a single disciplinary domain. It crosses number of boundaries. So you need to have multidisciplinary or you need to cross the disciplinary boundaries and you extend your research that can solve the problems that we face today and tomorrow. I hope you have that courage, you have that enthusiasm, you had, have that need to achieve what we expect you to achieve as a nation. So we wish all the young scientists a very rewarding session today at this virtual international conference for the young scientists on the multidisciplinary research. And I'm sure that you will be able to learn and share a lot of scientific information at this forum today. I wish you good luck and thank the organizing committee for inviting me. Wish you a very fruitful, rewarding day ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for joining with us online and sharing your valuable ideas. Now, I cordially invite the Chairman of the Board of Governance of NIFS, Professor Atula Sumati Pala, to deliver his speech. Professor Atula Sumati Pala will also be joining with us online. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Shalani. Good morning to everybody. Young Scientists Conference on Multidisciplinary Research 2021. I would also warmly welcome Professor Prasad Katulanda and Professor Tom Welton for joining us. And also thank you the chair for asking me to say a few words. I planned for a talk and most of it was uh, conveyed to you by our senior professor, acting director, Professor Ranjit Premalal Silva. So therefore I have decided to change, you know, what I want to share with you. Now, as we all know, we are celebrating our 40th anniversary and you are having this Young Scientist Conference today as part of it. And also at a time where we have faced a huge challenge of global pandemic of COVID. As a nation, we have been fortunate at least to do this as a hybrid event because of the success of vaccination, not only vaccination due to many other things. So in that context, uh, I'm talking to you through technology due to different limitations. Now, post-industrial knowledge economy of today clearly displays the close correlation among economic growth, innovation, and indigenous research capacity. University-based research has been most effective driver of such economically relevant innovation. As a result, leverage of public investment in universities to stimulate innovative research and development is now a critical need for a country to remain competitive in the global arena. Most high-ranking universities in the world are not just teaching universities, but they have been transformed into research universities. However, Sri Lanka needs a paradigm shift to make research and innovation core component of not only in postgraduate education, but also in undergraduate level of produ uh, produce individuals with both a creative vision and innovation, as well as sufficient intellectual breadth and depth to realize that vision. It's actually happening. I'm glad under our State Minister Honorable Dr. Sita Arambipola 
we have taken some of the steps in that right direction. And there is a clear association between countries' health, research, and development investment. Now, to me, a strategy is always capturing opportunity arising in a dynamic world, as scientific opportunities can not always be foreseen. The flexibility to respond to novel ideas with solid potential is therefore crucial for success. Now, that's where exactly the multidisciplinary research has a place. And as Professor Premalal de Silva very clearly said, doing research is not sufficient. Sharing that knowledge adequately, not only with intellectuals for intellectual simulation, but with the public is a must today because we carry forward the knowledge generated by our predecessors and we rely on public money for research. So research cannot be solely for producing theses, papers, promotion. Research has to be therefore for the benefit of people. Hence, a culture shift is a must in research for people's benefit. Any culture shift demand change in thinking, feelings and behaviors. The trial. So my plea to you, enjoy the conference. Yes, knowledge is important. We can share knowledge, we can generate knowledge, we can learn. But the most important thing, the message I want to tell you, the attitudinal shift. We all as scientists should not be 95 people. We should not think only about ourselves. Our thinking should be beyond us. That attributes, those attributes are essential for budding scientists to take a career in research for benefits beyond themselves, for benefit of the people and benefit of the country and the mankind as a whole. So at a time we are celebrating 40 years of anniversary, we, this is a very timely conference and I congratulate very much everybody, including Professor Iqbal for um, leading this program. Our uh, acting director, senior Professor, Ran Professor Pranjit Premlal de Silva, and also Professor Deepal Subhasingha, and the committee who has taken, captured this opportunity of 40 years anniversary celebration to enlighten the budding scientists to take a different pathways to our predecessors, mainly do more research, which are impactful for the benefit of the people. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts. So remember, at the end of the day, enjoy the conference, make attitudinal shift, do research for people's benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your inspiring words. Now it is the most awaited moment of the inaugural session, the keynote address. So. Let me invite Professor MCM Iqbal, Associate Professor in Plant and Environmental Sciences and the Editor-in-Chief of YSCMR 2021 to introduce the keynote speaker. So good morning to all of you. I also welcome all those present here live today, as well as those who are joining us virtually uh, to this YSA conference. So it is my privilege to introduce the keynote speaker today. And uh, he is none other than Professor Pandu Arnonak who is a professor at the Department of Clinical Medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. His specialty is in clinical infectious diseases, particularly leptospirosis and dengue. He is also an examiner at the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine and the MRCP UK examinations. We have, however, invited him not to speak of medicine, but to share with us his extensive, broad, and insightful outlook on the interface between the sciences and the society. He has a profound understanding 
on higher education, the social sciences, and humanities in Sri Lanka. He has written widely on these themes in the national press, as well as published books on these subjects. Let me relate a small anecdote. Last year, during the pandemic, the Open University of Sri Lanka held the annual sessions like us today in a virtual mode. At home, I overheard him delivering the keynote address and sat down to listen to him. After his inspiring talk, I then asked my wife, who is this sociologist speaking with such an insight and depth on our education system? She then identified him as a medical person with an abiding interest in the education system in this country and humanities. I then decided that we should invite him to the IFS at the next possible opportunity to broaden our own perspectives on themes beyond the experimental sciences. Over the past 10 years, he has written extensively on education in our country, transgressing from his primary vocation of caring for the sick. His most recent book is on ruptures in Sri Lanka's education. With this very brief introduction, it is my personal privilege and pleasure to invite Professor Panduka Karmanayaka to speak to us today. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Iqbal, for that warm introduction. Um, good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that I'm coming through clearly uh, with my uh, headphone microphone. Uh, let me start sharing my slides with you. Okay. So thank you once again. Um, so when the organizing committee of your conference uh, kindly invited me to deliver this uh, keynote speech, I was thrilled for two reasons. Uh, the first was, of course, the honor and privilege that you gave me. And the second was being specifically asked to speak on the role of science in society. My training in science at university level is limited to the biomedical sciences as a medical undergraduate and the social sciences as a roaming academic. So you would doubtless appreciate that my views are shaped by these two specific influences. Um, as a medical academic, the role of knowledge in society has been of great interest to me for several years. And whenever I examine this, I cannot escape thinking about science. That is because nowadays, much of the knowledge that pervades society, including much of the knowledge that I myself use as a medical doctor, has come from science. In today's society, science and knowledge are closely entwined. I don't claim that people in general are scientific, but their lives are shaped by technology, which is almost entirely based on science. Science has therefore created much of the knowledge that has given society its current shape, whether directly or indirectly, knowingly or unknowingly, beneficially or harmfully. For the remainder where it is not so responsible, science is also required to ask the opposite question, that is, why it is not able to enrich society in these areas. So the relationship between science and society, which is driven by knowledge, is a very important one. Let me start by outlining the boundaries of my talk. First, what is science? The Oxford Dictionary of English defines science as the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. You must forgive me for not feeling satisfied with that definition. Does this, for instance, help us to differentiate astronomy from astrology? Isn't astrology also intellectual and practical, systematic, relating to the natural world and consisting of observation and often also experimentation? So are we to accept astrology as a science? Where is the mention of what natural scientists call external validity? 
or what social scientists call reality congruence. There is a mention of predictive power. To me, simply, science is the systematic pursuit of valid knowledge. The validity is derived from empirical confirmation obtained repeatedly and consistently. Any reasoning that is inconsistent with empirical findings is not considered valid, even if it is quite rational on its own, and it would have to be discarded or modified. For the scientist, knowledge is useless if it is invalid, like astrology is. For the society, the work that scientists do will have no specialness without predictive power, which requires validity. Science, when so defined, is found in two forms. The first is the scientific mode of inquiry. It is a cognitive tool located in the privacy of our minds, a way of thinking and a manner of finding answers to questions. It requires special training. To me, the two persons who championed this in my schooling days in the 1970s were Professor Carlo Fonseca and Dr. E. W. Adhikaram. And in more recent times, I have, been, I have benefited from listening to and reading Professor S. N. Arsapujaratna. The knowledge of the scientific mode of inquiry would be useful to any citizen, but you would agree with me that it plays a very limited role in the wider society. Perhaps it plays a limited role even in the lives of most scientists themselves, both here and abroad. After all, often they too are known to believe in unscientific religious teachings and indulge in superstitious rituals in their private lives and to relegate the scientific mode of inquiry itself to their working hours. Indeed, if Professor Asakuratna is right, even most scientists who pursue or possess high research degrees in our country lack a knowledge of the scientific mode of inquiry. He has repeatedly highlighted our scientists' lack of knowledge on the philosophy of science. This can happen to us if, for instance, we equate the scientific mode of inquiry to the skills in using scientific tools such as laboratory bench work. Then we replace the cognitive tool with practical ritual and mistake one for the other. I believe that this is an important area for your organization to work on, perhaps through its currently inactive division for philosophy and social sciences. But I myself will say no more about that today. The second form that science can take is the modern scientific enterprise, the collective effort of scientists located within society. This creates a huge body of knowledge that is included in our school textbooks and university courses and use the technological products that add health, safety, and comfort to the lives of people. The modern scientific enterprise has a far more pervasive presence in people's lives than uh, the scientific mode of inquiry. Indeed, this is so pervasive that even unscientific religious beliefs and superstitious rituals are nowadays spread in society using scientific mass communication technology, such as the print, electronic, and social media, reaching millions of people through science-based products such as vehicles, televisions, and smartphones. But the modern scientific enterprise produces not only health, safety, and comfort, it often also produces their polar opposites. It is because of this pervasiveness and this unwholesomeness that today I wish to talk to you about the role of this modern scientific enterprise in society. To understand the exact association between science and society, let me spend some time explaining to you exactly how it emerged in human society. Of course, the scientific mode of inquiry itself has had many historical pioneers, such as Copernicus or Galileo, or before that, the intellectuals of the golden age of Islam, such as the Mutasilites, or before even that, Archimedes or Pythagoras from ancient Greece. But what, is about, but what about the modern scientific enterprise? How did that emerge in human society? To this question, let me offer a rather unconventional answer. I myself found this answer from one of my favorite books, a book called Medicine, Magic and Religion by W.H.R. Rivers. Rivers was a medical doctor and an anthropologist, a Cambridge scholar, who headed an anthropological expedition to the Torres Straits in 1898. The indigenous people there formed a preliterate hunter-gatherer society 10,000 years after the invention of agriculture and a century after industrialization. Such so-called primitive societies teach us priceless lessons. Rivers studied how these pre-literate and pre-agricultural people understood nature and lived in it. This is important because any serious division of labor and specialization in human societies 
took place only after the introduction of agriculture. Today, we think of medicine, magic, and religion as three separate things. But in pre-literate societies, they were all one. The healer, the sorcerer, and the priest were all one, and we called him the shaman. Let us focus on magic and religion. These two forms, the sorcerer's way and the priest's way, constituted how the preliterate human beings saw nature and dealt with it. Let me take a passage from Weaver's book. When I speak of magic, I shall mean a group of processes in which man uses rights which depend for their efficacy on his own power or on powers believed to be inherent in or the attributes of certain objects or processes which are used in these rites. Religion, on the other hand, will comprise a group of processes, the efficacy of which depends on the will of some higher power, some power whose intervention is sought by rites of supplication and propitiation. So Rivers identified two modes in which the shaman worked. In the first mode, what I will call the sorcerer mode, the shaman depended either on his own abilities or the properties of the material he used. In the other mode, what I would call the priest mode, the shaman appealed to a higher, unfold, unseen superpower. Regarding the priest mode, I will only say two things. First, there was no empirical verification. Second, they persisted with these elaborate yet false premises in spite of their invalidity because of superstition. It is a strong psychological force that is based on the conditioned reflex. You might be surprised to know that scientific research has proven that even birds are superstitious. Behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner proved this in experiments he did way back in 1947. Is it any wonder then that we humans too have irresistible superstitious surges? But I am more interested in the shaman's sorcerer mode. Here, he wanted to depend on his own powers, such as the knowledge of the fauna and flora or weather patterns, or on the qualities of his material, such as plants, minerals, or his tools. To find what worked and what didn't, he used trial and error or empirical verification. His theories thus changed with experience, so they could not remain false premises for long. In fact, Rivers was one of the first anthropologists who pointed out that these shamans were themselves actually quite rational, although based on false premises sometimes. I am sure you can now sense what I'm getting at. You can see that this is the scientific mode of inquiry in its most elementary form. Magicians who specialized in sorcery, alchemy, or the occult continued to exist in agricultural societies. They created their illusions and make believe both for the public's entertainment or to serve more ulterior motives, such as fooling the people or frightening them into a submission in the service of their rulers. When you think about it, a successful magician can produce effective sorcery only if he has valid knowledge of the material world. This knowledge has to be valid illusions through the manipulation of that material. He may, of course, claim that he's doing it with supernatural powers, but obviously his real secret is the valid knowledge of nature. In the 17th century, when Sir Francis Bacon and his colleagues ushered in the modern scientific enterprise, they actually started with the magicians. In John Henry's biography of Bacon, titled Knowledge is Power, he describes how Bacon and his colleagues carefully studied these magic feats by observing them, and sometimes by doing experiments carefully in amateur laboratories in their own ba home basements. These were men of affluence and leisure. Robert Boyle, for example, was the son of the richest man in England at that time. As one of Bacon's contemporaries, Cornelius Agrippa wrote, magicians are careful explorers of nature, only, directly, only detecting what nature has formally prepared, often succeeding in anticipating results so that these things are popularly held to be miracles when they are really no more than anticipations of natural operations. Bacon introduced three new ideas. The first was inductive logic. The second was the value of the experimental method. In fact, it was this very belief that made him go towards magic and sorcery because it allowed him to escape the, the scholastic philosophy of prevailing universities. The third idea was that this knowledge should be put in the service of humanity, rather than think of it as something ornamental or entertaining. In his influential book, New Organon, Bacon identified magic as one of the few really important phenomena of nature, from the study of which, he says, there cannot but follow an improvement in man's estate and an enlargement of his power over nature. 
as Bacon famously said, knowledge is power. It is this lofty idea that separated and differentiated scientists from sorcerers. Sorcerers used this power for themselves and their rulers. Bacon harnessed it for humanity in general. Interestingly, here is Bacon describing three levels of human ambition in New Organa. The first is of those who decide to extend their own power in their native country, which kind is vulgar and degenerate. The second is of those who labor to extend the power of their country and its dominion among men. This certainly has more dignity, though not less covetousness. But if a man endeavor to establish and extend the power and dominion of the human race itself over the universe, his ambition is without doubt both a more wholesome thing and a more noble than the other two. I guess that today we should now add a fourth level to this, which is to promote the welfare of not merely the human race, but the whole biosphere. But at least this is a good starting point. Bacon then created the Royal Society and the world's first scientific journal, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. These allowed these gentlemen of curiosity and leisure to share their findings publicly, claim credit, face peer review, and learn from each other. Thus was born the modern scientific enterprise that you are all part of. That was in the 1660s. Let me now quickly trace the important turning points in the history of this modern scientific enterprise. The usefulness of this valid knowledge didn't take long to receive wide appreciation, especially in agriculture, manufacture, warfare, and navigation. It gave rise to the steam engine and industrial revolution, the railways and the telegraph that, that commenced the contra contraction of the world, the navies and armories that powered modern empires, colonialism, and capitalism. It also facilitated amazing improvements in civil engineering that enabled better transport, fresh food, better clothing and housing, and healthier living. The chemical industries lay at the heart of the biomedical sciences such as pathology, bacteriology, and pharmacology. Abraham Lincoln took knowledge to the doorstep of the American masses through the land-grant colleges, making the US the country with the world's largest agricultural surplus. European enlightenment was in full swing animated by the positivism of the scientific mode of inquiry and powered by the modern scientific enterprise. The Western public gradually became disenchanted with religion. Governments of Western nation states saw the value of scientific knowledge. Gradually, the location of the production of scientific knowledge shifted from the basements of those curious gentlemen to the university laboratories which were government funded. The modern scientific enterprise became owned and controlled by the ethnocentric nationalistic governments. Science became imperial science. Now, scientists created knowledge and technology and politicians controlled its use. The culmination of this process was the two world wars of the 20th century. A sociologist Charles Stop wrote, if the 19th century saw the mechanization and industrialization of warfare, the 20th century has been sh shaped by the scientization of war, a development indicated by the characterization, albeit caricatured, of the First World War as the chemist's war and the Second World War as the physicist's war. The point that Pope didn't include here is the role of the biologist and the medical doctor in biological warfare and cruel human experiments on prisoners of war. In exasperation, Bertrand Russell, who was a pacifist, exclaimed, science has made it inevitable that all must live or all must die. Following the two world wars, governments needed to give in to democracy and focus on welfare projects. Also, science was gradually becoming more costly. So the government's role here was taken over by the industries and multinational corporations. The resulting alliance between the government, the universities and the industry came to be known as the triple helix. The modern scientific enterprise was reincarnated in two of those three strands, namely the research university and the industrial laboratory. Scientists were now knowledge workers in a knowledge society whose legitimacy was based on the contribution they made to the company's share price, the industry's growth, or the nation's cross-national product. The professions clamored to gain legitimacy in society by incorporating more and more science into their subject and practices with the medical profession taking the lead. 
it didn't take long for the public to see that the enterprise that Bacon had started has lost its way. It was now science's turn to be the disenchanted. By the 1960s, the dissolution youth gave birth to the counterculture movement, which commenced the deprofessionalization of society and the public's re-enchantment with nature or naturalness. One of the essential prerequisites for capitalist industrial growth was mass consumption. <clears throat> Excuse me. Naturally then, these industries spent a lot of money on marketing and brand promotion. Sometimes they spent more on these than even the manufacturing itself. As a result, today we have a highly individualistic consumerist society. In this scenario, scientists have been subverted too. They are now producing what the industry wants, which is producing what the customers want, who are wanting what marketing makes them want, which is determined by the industry. If all that these things, sorry, if all that these things did was create industrial profits, I suppose it might have been acceptable, but we know that there is more. We know that the modern scientific enterprises and its technology are rapidly leading to resource depletion, environmental degradation and climate change. There is also the discontentment and dissatisfaction among the people that come from their heightened expectations, unfulfilled appetites, and unmet demands. There is also widening inequity, increasing exploitation, and worsening discrimination, all of which fuel disillusionment, conflict, and destruction. The earth is reeling under the Anthropocene and being, becoming in, unhabitable to life in general. This is why I said at the beginning that science is giving us not only health, safety, and comfort, but also they are polar opposites. I'm reminded of Mahatma Gandhi's wisdom. There is sufficiency in this world for man's needs, but not his greeds. At the end of the Second World War, scientists got a shock when they saw the mushroom cloud. Today, the same shock must come to our minds. When we see the acceleration of the hydrological cycle, the emergence of new infectious diseases, the alarming increase in cancers and kidney disease, the suffering and destruction brought on by terrible weapons, the mining of the earth and the entry of heavy metals into our food chains, the mindless consumerism that is driven by information and communication technology, and so on. My own field of medicine is a good mirror for all of us. Its current situation was nicely encapsulated by James Lefano in his 1999 book, The Rise and Fall of Modern Medicine, when he identified four paradoxes. One, medicine is spectacularly successful, but doctors are disillusioned. Two, people are healthier than ever, but they are more worried about their health than ever. Three, medicine is enormously effective, but the popularity of alternative medicine is rising. And four, medicine is more useful than ever, but it is costlier than ever. I believe that the situation in science is not much different. We are disillusioned with science, worried about the hazards and risks it produces, concerned about its cost, disappointed with its inequitable distribution, and looking for alternatives in the form of natural happiness. Obviously, something isn't right. I quickly took you through this history to raise a troubling question. Are today's scientists still Bacon's disciples? wrestling secrets from nature and designing solutions to humanity's problems, enhancing its health, safety, and comfort? Or are they like the pre-Baconian sorcerers, creating illusions and make-believe for consumption by the populace or abuse by the rulers? Are we still continuing Bacon's legacy, or are we now in the post-Baconian era? Don't misunderstand me. I am still, I'm indeed aware that there are still scientists both here and abroad, who has spent a lifetime working in the path that Bacon showed us. But if those four paradoxes from medicine bring a bell in your minds as scientists, something is not right at the collective level. Why did science get to be like this? The first mistake that scientists made resulted from the fact-value distinction. You may have heard of David Hume's assertion that we cannot go from an is statement to an ought to statement. That is, a study of facts cannot answer a question on values. True to this assertion, scientists have always made every effort possible to avoid value judgments. They have actually prided themselves on this because it was believed 
that avoiding value judgments gives science its objectivity and validity. Today, there are three points we must note regarding this, and I will mention them only very briefly. The first point is, the philosophy of science has moved on from this positivism to what is known as post-positivism. We now take into account not only the object that is being observed, but also the conceptualizations and interpretations in the mind of the subject that makes those observations, namely the scientist. Indeed, sociologists of knowledge say that we must replace the object-subject dyad with the object-language-subject triad, because language also shapes this knowledge. The second point is, the natural sciences are now moving into the field of morality or values also, with fascinating work in child psychology, primatology, functional MRI studies, social neuroscience, and so on. This trend has been called naturalization of bioethics, and it promises to take ethics from a normative subject to a natural scientific subject. But the third point is the most important. It was a mistake to think that not making value judgments during scientific research also requires not making value judgments on the manner in which science and technology are used in the service of humanity. It is this ostrich-like attitude that simplistically made scientists manufacture knowledge and leave the decisions regarding its use to politicians or the captains of the industry. That is how we got to the mess we are in today. But I can think of two scientists who refused to do this and made the value judgments too. The first is J. Robert Oppenheimer, the physicist who led the Manhattan Project. During the Second World War, Oppenheimer helped the US government to manufacture the atomic bomb because he believed that this would help to defeat Hitler's Nazi Germany. He isn't seen in good light by many today because of this. But about a decade later, during the Cold War, Oppenheimer also advised the US government to not build the hydrogen bomb because he believed that defeating the communist Soviet Union was not as desperate a requirement for humanity as defeating Hitler was. So he was a scientist making two value judgments on the use of his technology. If you know Oppenheimer's life story, you would know that subsequently he had to pay dearly for his change of mind. The second scientist is Robert K. Crane, an American biochemist. In the 1950s, he discovered the glucose sodium co-transport mechanism in the small intestinal mucosa. He knew the value of this discovery for the treatment of cholera and childhood diarrhea, two conditions that were lethal in poor countries because the only available treatment at that time, intravenous saline, was prohibitively expensive those days. Crane could have, could have been a millionaire if he sold his patent to a pharmaceutical company. But instead, he gave it free to the World Health Organization, which gave it to all the countries and advised them to use it to manufacture what is called the oral rehydration solution. In Sri Lanka, this is what we call Jeevani. The 1978 editorial in the leading medical journal, The Lancet, described Crane's discovery as potentially the most important medical advance this century. And on its 50th anniversary, it is estimated to have saved 54 million lives mostly children in poor third world countries. I think these decisions would have pleased Sir Francis Baker. There must have been many reasons why the scientific community failed to make value judgments regarding the applications of scientific technology. One reason may have been the fact that any control over its use was taken away from their hands, first by governments and later by the industry. A second reason may have been their own unfamiliarity with matters related to culture, economics, and politics. Charles Thorpe evocatively described this as choosing the comfort of the minor uncertainties of their own subjects to the major uncertainties in the world outside. The third reason was their tendency to specialize and super specialize, which made them unaware of science as a whole and therefore unwilling to speak beyond their own area of expertise. The fourth reason may have been the fact that a wide gulf gradually arose between themselves and policymakers and the public and they felt increasingly uncomfortable in public affairs. In fact, if we are to take seriously the recent upsurge in interest in what is known as open science or open in innovation or citizen science, it is quite possible that the modern scientific enterprise is now coming full circle. An enterprise that was started by amateur scientists in the 1660s 
is now being taken over by the citizens of the world with knowledge, pro knowledge production shifting from research universities and industrial laboratories back to ordinary citizens, thanks to the democratizing potential of digital technology. I can summarize all these reasons and trends in one phrase, the philosophy and sociology of science. You can now see why I have great hope that the division of philosophy and social science, once it is reactivated, would serve as the saving grace, at least for local science. As the singular proverb goes, a man who fell through the mouth of the well must also come out to the same mouth. Let me now conclude my keynote speech by recapitulating its chief points. I would like to think of science as the systematic pursuit of valid knowledge. The modern scientific enterprise was born in the 17th century to use the power of that valid knowledge in the service of humanity. However, scientists from an early stage made the mistake of not paying attention to making valid judgments about how that knowledge was put into use. As a result, it came to serve not humanity, but politicians and businessmen with megalomania. The price we had had to pay for this has been enormous. And now, not only humanity, but the whole biosphere on earth is destined to pay for it. I think that the way out of this is through the efforts of scientists themselves. Scientists must get involved with decisions regarding the applications of what they create. They should combine specialization with, with cross fertilization, not only within the natural sciences, but also with the social sciences. They need to rekindle their responsibility to humanity. They must get interested in the philosophy and sociology of science, as well as public engagement with science. The promise of science, the training of scientists, and the role of the modern scientific enterprise in society must be seen through this lens. The power lying in your capabilities is enormous, and therefore, the responsibility in your hands is enormous too. Please use it well so that we can look up to you with pride and in admiration. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share these views with you. And finally, let me sink into some superstition of my own and wish you all the very best with your conference and your careers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pandula Karunanayaka, for that informative talk. We have another exciting speech lined up in today's agenda. It is by our guest speaker, Professor Tom Welton. I'm pleased to invite Professor Siti Iqbal, retired professor in chemistry, Open University of Sri Lanka, to introduce the guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Shailini. Good morning to you all. It gave me great pleasure to introduce Professor Welton uh, to you. Thomas Welton received his BSc, uh, BSc honors in chemistry in 1985 and DPhil in 1990, both from the University of Sussex. He began his career at Imperial College London as a Lloyds of, uh, Lloyds of London Tercentenary Fellow in 1993. He became a lecturer in 1995 and was promoted to full professor in 2004. During his tenure, he has served the chemistry department's director of undergraduate study and then the dean of the, uh, the head of the department of chemistry from 2007 to 2014. In January 2015, he became the dean of the faculty of natural sciences. He is a fellow and currently the president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Professor Welton works in the field of sustainable chemistry with particular focus on ionic liquids and their interaction with solutes and the resulting effects on chemical reactions. His research group also works on applications for these phenomena in developing environmentally safe organic synthesis and in the production of biofuels. He was also the world's first professor of sustainable chemistry. 
Professor Welton is an advocate for diversity in academic science. In 2013, under his leadership, the Department of Chemistry, Imperial College London, was one of the four university departments in the United Kingdom to be awarded an Athena Swan Gold Award in recognition of efforts to promote women in science. He supports academic institutions around the world in their efforts to improve diversity and equality. Professor Welton received an OBE, Officer of the Order of the British Empire in 2017 for his services to diversity in higher education. Over to you, Professor Welton, to deliver your guest talk on a current and timely topic, sustainability in chemistry. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Professor Tom Welton, currently President of the Royal Society of Chemistry and also Professor of Sustainable Chemistry at Imperial College in London. And today I'm going to talk to you about chemistry for sustainability. It's always difficult to know where something started, but I think that this isn't a bad place for us to choose. And this is um, the UN World Commission on Environment and Development, sometimes called the Brundtland Commission, after Gro Brundtland, the woman you can see in the photograph here, who wrote a report in 1987, Our Common Future. And in this report, it is defined sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This is a very simple and elegant idea and has been used widely ever since. And so now we can think about sustainable chemistry. And sustainable chemistry becomes chemistry that has the implementation of that idea of sustainability in the production and use of chemical products. And that might be um, a, a reasonable uh, definition of what we currently call green chemistry. And then there's an important and. And that and is the application of chemistry and chemical products to enable sustainable development to occur. in Rome. And here's another photograph taken just eight years later in 2013 from almost exactly the same place. And we can see that there's a very clear difference between the two. And of course, in the later photograph, we're seeing the bright lights of the screens of our smartphones. Now here is a representation of all the different elements that you can find in a smartphone. Some of them are very common, like silicon and oxygen. Others much rarer, like europium and dysprosium. But I would like to bring your attention to these three elements here. Indian, tin and oxygen. And combined, these together make indium tin oxide. And tin, indium tin oxide is absolutely vital to the use of our mobile phones because it provides the swipey screen that we can use to give our phone instructions. And the reason for that is that indium tin oxide is transparent, so you can see through it for the screen, but it also conducts electricity, which allows your finger touch to give an instruction to your phone. So it's absolutely vital to the operation of the phone. Here we've got a very unusual looking periodic table, 
Um, it was uh, designed in 2019 for the International Year of the Periodic Table by the European Chemical Society. And what it represents is the abundance of various different elements in the Earth's crust and how that abundance compares to how we use them. And so we see different size boxes and um, this is a representation of how much of that element there is in the Earth's crust. And it's a logarithmic scale. So twice as big is 10 times the amount. It's also color coded. And we can see green. Um, and green means that you know, this element is in absolutely plentiful supply, given how we use it or how we expect to use it. Then we move on to yellow and the yellow elements, there is some limited availability and maybe some future risk that we need to be concerned about. As we move on to um, amber, then we see a rising threat to that element as we um, move forward. And finally, the red elements, which are elements under serious threat of depletion in the next hundred years, given how we use those elements today. And there we see indium and tin. Tin is yellow, but more worryingly, indium is red. So it is an element that's under threat. And so we've gone in a very short space of time to at the beginning of this century, Indium was used a little, but it was not of great interest to anyone other than, you know, inorganic chemists and materials chemists. It certainly wasn't vital for how we live our lives. To something that, well, I defy any of you to give up the use of your smartphone for the next three months. I doubt you would last any more than three days. And so indium is now essential for how we live our life. And so in a very short period of time, in that period just between 2005 and 2013, eight years, we went from indium being something that none of us really cared about to something we all rely upon in our daily lives and at serious threat of depletion, so a serious sustainability risk. And if we can't predict something over such a short period, how do we expect to be able to predict 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years into the future what the needs of future generations are going to be? Here's another way of thinking about problems around predictability. And so if I were to say, oh, in my lab, we have um, invented a petrol additive, it increases the performance of the engine, gives more power um, for the fuel burn. It therefore increases fuel efficiency so we can drive further with less fuel and so less CO2 emissions. Also, it decreases engine wear. So the engine will last for longer, the car will last for longer before we need to renew it. These all sound fantastic and wouldn't we want to introduce it straight away? And indeed, it was thought to be fantastic. And it was introduced in, 19, uh, in the early 1920s. And its inventor, Thomas Midgley, received an ACS award for its introduction. However, it was later shown that this additive, which of course was tetraethyl lead, produced neurotoxic emissions, especially for children. And when I was young, I can remember there being lots of uh, discussion on the news about the uh, neurological development of young children who lived near particularly busy roads. It can also cause hypertension in adults. Is the chemistry. And so the tetraethyl lead burns in oxygen to give lead and carbon dioxide um, and water. 
and it's a very efficient burn. And that's what the value is that it gave to the petrol. It gave the petrol much more efficient burning. Yeah. That lead, though, further oxidizes to give lead oxide. Yeah. That yeah. Would yeah. then yeah. build up yeah. as solid yeah. in the engine, it would actually damage the engine rather than give it longer life. Yeah. And so something needed to be added to prevent that problem. And dihalogenoethanes were the choice. And what yeah. they did, they reacted with the lead to give lead yeah. halide um, complexes, which were volatile and so did not um, deposit in the engine. And those volatile emissions were what caused the problem. Uh -huh. Eventually, this problem was solved by replacing the um, lead with uh, so-called oxygenate, so things like alcohols, ethers, esters even, and um, improvements in engine design. And this person, Derek Bryce Smith, um, was awarded in 1984 an RSC award for implementing the research that um, led to the replacement of um, tetraethyl lead. But how? So back in the 1950s, he was a uh, young researcher working in a synthetic mm -hmm. chemistry lab, and he needed to use tetraethyl lead for one of his experiments. And so he did the responsible thing and did the full safety analysis and found out about it and what special um, conditions he needed mm -hmm. to use to protect himself from this okay. high mm -hmm. agent. And he kind of thought, hang on, <laughs> we put this in petrol, <laughs> there must be a problem here and initiated the research into um, the problems of lead-free petrol. It took over 30 years from that realization that there was a problem for lead-free petrol to be introduced here in the UK um, in 1986. The government um, taxed uh, unleaded petrol less than it did leaded petrol in order to try and promote um, its uptake. But it was not until 1999, the turn of the century, that they finally banned the use of leaded petrol. So from the 1920s through to the 1950s before the problem was realized, and then to the turn of the next century before the problem was fully dealt with. That was it. So just this year in 2021, a study from Imperial College has shown that 50% of the lead pollution in London today is legacy lead from the days of unleaded petrol. So here we are, a good 100 years after the introdu introduction of leaded petrol, a good 20 years after um, its banning, and yet we still have environmental problems associated with it. And so again, predictability is extremely difficult. So today, um, uh, the idea of sustainable development has also moved on somewhat from you know, that very simple statement. And now we tend to think about sustainable development in the context of these, the sustainable development goals. And uh, you're probably familiar with them. Uh, there are 17 of them. Some of them are very obviously technical, like number seven, affordable and clean energy, others, more societal, like uh, number 10, reduced inequality. And I would say that chemistry and chemical scientists have a contribution to make to all of these sustainable development goals. In fact, I would say, I don't think any of these sustainable development goals can be achieved without the contribution of chemistry and chemical sciences. And yet, I find myself very often in my role as president talking to policymakers and politicians um, about chemicals and the, the chemical industries. And all those conversations always focus on this one, responsible consumption and production. Now, of course, responsible and uh, consumption and production 
is vitally important. It is absolutely essential that we look at implementation, implementing the sustainable development in the production and use of chemicals. But I think it's a terrible loss that we don't get to show how important chemistry is so that the right decisions can be made regarding chemistry to enable the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Now I'm going to look at that affordable and clean energy for a moment and then, you know, maybe giving a slightly better story around predictability. So in many parts of the world, um, the green energy transformation is well underway and there are many technologies um, that are used to provide this, solar for instance, but I want to talk about wind power today and particularly wind turbines. And so wind turbines have within them um, uh, electric motors and rare earth magnets. So dysprosium, neodymium, terbium, these kind of elements are contained within the turbines themselves. Going back to our periodic table, where do we find them? Well, we find them down here and we can see that you know, uh, neodymium is colored yellow and dysprosium is colored amber and so under rising threat. And of course, this is something that we need to think about as we try and implement this top technology more widely across the world. Will these elements change their colors? And so, where do they come from? Well, of course, the rare earths come from mining and uh, mining itself is a highly polluting industry. And even once the ore has been um, uh, collected out of the ground, the rare earth metals are difficult and expensive to separate from the ores. However, I'd like to think about this. And so a typical lifetime for a wind turbine is 20 years. We might manage to extend it to 30, say, but you know, in a few decades, we will have a need to be able to recycle disused end of life wind turbines. And it's an opportunity because of course, what we will find is we have those rare earth metals that we can reclaim from the current rarer magnets that are being used. And indeed it may transpire, in fact, I expect it will, that the recovery of rare earth metals from wind turbines will be less environmentally damaging, easier and cheaper than mining the ore directly. So this is a huge opportunity that's going to come our way. And we know it's coming because we do know that these turbines have a lifetime of 20 or so years. We do know that the time will come to decommission. We do know that we will have the opportunity to reclaim these rare earth metals and indeed other elements and materials from these wind turbines. So we should be thinking about the research which is necessary now to enable us to do that then. It would be foolhardy to wait for 20 years and then suddenly say, oh, we need to think about how we reclaim rare earth metals from these magnets. We need to be developing those technologies now. And that will give us an even more sustainable future. Moving on with the energy transformation, I'd also like to think about something else that, that, that we can know already. And one of the things that's happening again across the world is the introduction of battery driven cars to replace petrol um, and diesel cars. Uh, they have batteries which uh, contain lithium um, as the electrolyte, have cobalt in the electrodes. And there is, of course, concern about the abundance and availability of these elements. But I want to think about something else. And that's this. And again, this is something we know. We know that battery operated cars are heavier than the petrol and diesel cars that they are going to replace. And this has consequences. This will have consequences of greater road wear, greater tire wear on the car, 
greater brake wear on the car, and that means greater particulate pollution. So we can predict that this is going to become an increasing problem that will need addressing. And of course, it is vital that we do this, and chemistry has a wonderful role to be able to play in developing uh, new materials for roads, for tires, and of course, for brakes. And so it is research that we should be doing now not waiting until a major part of the fleet is um, battery operated, but preparing for those days now. So there are some things we can predict and we should act on. Now I'd like to look at another area in which chemistry can contribute, and that is around zero hunger. But what I want you to show, to show you here is that um, Indeed, in uh, dealing and tackling a problem of, of zero hunger, we have to think about responsible consumption and production again, and um, industry innovation and infrastructure and how these will be developed further. So we are all aware that um, ammonia-based fertilizers have been transformational in the agriculture across the world. They account for between 30 and 50% of the increased crop yield that was achieved in the 20th century and are estimated to support approximately 40% of the world population's food needs. So already chemistry is making a huge contribution to zero hunger. We know that um, this is how ammonia is made. It's the Harbour Bosch process, um, which was invented in uh, 1908. And it's the direct reaction of nitrogen and hydrogen over an iron catalyst to give ammonia. We further know, we even use this as an example, don't we, to teach the Le Chatelier principle. And in order to push the equilibrium to the product side, we need to use high temperatures and high pressures. And this is a very energy demanding process, which uses 5% of the world's methane. Oh, I can't see any methane in this reaction. So what's the methane for? Well, it is of course, how we make the hydrogen. Hydrogen is produced by the steam reforming of methane. And so the methane is heated under high pressure and high temperature with water to give carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Further reaction of that carbon monoxide with more water gives um, CO2 and hydrogen. So it's very, very demanding of methane, very topical um, given what's happening to world methane prices at this very moment. So, of course, um, you know one of the current themes of research is the sustainable um, production of hydrogen. And the favorite way of doing that is the electrolysis of water. And so, you know, we react um, water in an appropriate electrochemical cell. Here are the two half reactions to give us hydrogen and oxygen. So we get our clean hydrogen straight from water, no methane, however, we need to consider this. Where does the energy come from for this process? And of course, it comes from the grid. And whilst we have an electricity grid that has the majority of its power coming from unsustainable sources, this will be an unsustainable production process. And so we as, as chemists need to think through the immediacy of the thing that we are researching on and think to the consequences and the next level um, of our technologies. So a way in which you might um, go about solving this problem would be to perhaps coat your electrodes with um, an appropriate photovoltaic um, uh, uh, material and to have photolytic electrolysis of water. So direct sunlight um, providing the energy for the electrolysis of water. And this would indeed be a sustainable method 
for the production of hydrogen. So let's go back to the harbour Bosch process. Um, it's, we've now got our sustainable hydrogen, but still the process requires high temperatures and high pressures and is highly energy intensive. Of course, there is an electrochemical solution to this as well. But again, I refer to everything that I have just said about the source of the energy for this. So there's a huge amount of work to be done on the production of ammonia, even though it's a current process of over 100 years to replace that process with a more sustainable alternative. Lots of research to be done. And so just to end with, I will return you to the sustainable development goals and remind you again that, you know, I truly believe that without of chemists and chemical scientists and chemistry, none of these goals can be achieved. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming and listening to me. Thank you very much, Professor Tom Milton. Now it's the time for the conference photographs. Photograph. So uh, let me ask you, to kindly uh, switch on your cameras and we are going to take a screenshot. Thank you, everyone. Now we have come to the end of the inaugural session. And I, now I would like to kindly call upon Professor MCM Iqbal, the Editor-in-Chief of YSCMR 2021, to deliver the vote of thanks. Um, thank you, Shalini. And of course, uh, it is nice to note that uh, we are sticking to the schedule. We should conferences don't stick to schedules. We are probably it's fine. Uh, so let me, uh, as the editor of this conference, convey my thanks and appreciation to a lot of people who are very positive. <clears throat> the YSA is conducting third international annual conference on multidisciplinary research for young scientists. This year too, the conference is conducted in a virtual mode, a consequence of the corona pandemic with which we are yet to come to terms. This year also marks the 40th anniversary of the founding of the NIFS, and this conference is a part of the anniversary celebrations. Organizing any conference is a formidable task. It is more so when the activities need to be coordinated between different disciplines, finding and obtaining the consent of reviewers on subjects that are quite foreign to our research assistants, handling the reviews, corresponding with the authors and reviewers amongst many other activities. 
when you add another dimension of conducting all this in a virtual mode, the tasks go beyond the realms of a formidable challenge. The YSA in general and the teams of research assistants behind this conference in particular have gone beyond their call of duty attending to the minor and major details to make this conference a success. They made my task of handling over 170 abstracts not only easier, but also a present one. We conducted four pre-conference webinars for the young scientists. We thank Professor Rohan Virusuria from the IFS, Dr. Kaumal from the University of Colombo, and Professor Viranja Karan Ratna from the Vice Chancellor of the Slintech Academy for conducting these webinars. They were well received with over 100 participants for each webinar. We also thank our keynote speaker today, Professor Kanduka Karnanayaka from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and our guest speaker from Imperial College, London, Professor Tim, Tom Welton, for graciously accepting our invitations and taking time off from their busy schedules to speak to us today. My sincere gratitude to the co editors on the editorial board, some of whom are present here, who did a tremendous job in handling the different disciplines in finding reviewers for the abstracts, besides corresponding with the authors and reviewers. We are extremely thankful to our reviewers for the insightfulness of their reviews and improving the standards of the published abstracts. I also thank the Science Education and Dissemination Unit and the computer unit of the NIFS for handling the technicalities of conducting six parallel sessions effectively. This year, our regular sponsors could not assist us. We are very grateful to our director, Professor Ranjit Premilal de Silva, for finding us the funds without any hesitancy. We also thank him and our chairman, Professor Atula Sumati Pala, for their messages, support, and encouragement for this conference. We were overwhelmed by the young scientists who contributed their research work to our conference. Their work is an indication of the multidisciplinary nature of science today. We thank all the contributors for their sense of trust and esteem they have in our conference. Finally, minor lapses would have occurred such as reviewers receiving multiple emails and reminders from us and miscellaneous other delays. As editor in chief, I take responsibility for all these lapses. And the bouquets that you may have belongs to the untiring teams of the YSA. For me, it has been a pleasure working with them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before we move on to the technical sessions of the conference, I would like to invite the co-chair of the conference, Ms. Kavindya Samarakorn, to give a brief introduction to technical sessions. I wish you all a fruitful day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shalini. Today's conference will be conducted in six parallel technical sessions. As session one, physical sciences, session two, social sciences, session three, chemical sciences, session four, biological sciences A, session five, biological sciences B, and session six, biological sciences C. We would like to request all the presenters to log into your respective session by 11 a.m. after the tea break. Hope you have a fruitful day at YSCMR. Thank you.